Sorry to keep you waiting, folks. It's quite a long trek off my hotel, and it's really, really warm this morning, just for a change. So, by now you probably know who I am, just in case you don't. I'm Steve McIntyre. I've been in Debbie a very long time. Um, I'm also employed by ARM. One of the reasons, one of the things I do get to do as part of my day job, and I think this is awesome, is to help make the Debian ARM port work. Um, I'm not the only one, I'm not going to claim too much credit here, but you know, we have quite a number of dedicated ARM porters in Debian. Um, I think we, after, the, after x86, we are clearly the most common um, set of architectures, or the most commonly used architectures. Um, so let's have an update. So I'm going to talk about current status of ports. Build decent hardware is a topic that just keeps on giving and giving every year. Um, I'd like to have some discussion. Again, this is a boff. You know, the, the, that's in the title. I'm going to ram it down your throats again. I only have a few slides here. I don't want to be talking solidly for 40 minutes. Please talk to me. Please let's share ideas. I don't pretend to know everything. Uh, and um, as per, per normal, I will write up a summary of what's discussed here. Um, it will help me immensely if people can take notes on, on what goes on. Um, I've already got a gobby document started. So, quick update one down on the ports. ARM64 is our most recent port. First release with Jesse. It's working really, really well, I think. Um, we support um, quite a range of the current hardware that's out there. There are lots of devices available now. Obviously, there will be many, many more coming. Um, we can also run ARM64 on real server hardware. Um, that is a big win, it's, and we'll come back to that shortly. Um, we have a very simple choice of kernels for ARM64 in Debian. Um, there is one. Um, it will work with either DTB or AP to tell the kernel about the config of your device. Um, you tend to see that the split is more simple. Small devices will still be using device tree, um, bigger server boxes, the standards all say they should be doing ACP, and most of them do. Sometimes it even works. So, OMHF is a bit older. We first released it with Wheezy. Um, the details of the ABI are well understood by now, I hope, but I will mention them again. We have, it's a hard float ABI, so that means that floating point registers are passed using hardware floating point registers. What did I just say? Yeah, so floating point arguments are passed. Um, it's the minimum spec is on v7 using the VFPV3 D16 set of registers, which is a lovely bit of alphabet soup, which probably doesn't mean much to most people. It means that it is guaranteed to work on any v7 CPU that has hardware floating point. The vast majority of them do, some of them don't. We try not to talk about those because I think they're brain dead. Um, we don't depend on Neon because Neon is optional in a number of V7 CPUs. In fact, it's optional in V7. There are not many, but sufficient V7 CPUs don't have Neon that we haven't pushed it. Um, now, one of the nice things about this ABI is that it was agreed as a standard across all of the distros doing V7. So you can take a binary built on Debian, and you should be able to run it on Fedora, SUSE, Gentoo, wherever, and vice versa. Um, we have a couple of kernels available. We have the OMMP kernel, and we have an LPAE version. So if you have your 32-bit machine with oodles of memory, you can actually use it effectively. Um, again, this is all tends to run with, with device tree, so in theory, assuming that your SOC vendor has pushed support for their devices upstream, um, our kernel could well support your device fully out of the box before we even know about it. Potentially. It depends, obviously. Um, RHF UEFI is a growing thing. Um, if we want to run VMs um, sensibly of RHF running on ARM64, for example, 
then UEFI will make it reasonably easy to have a working bootloader inside an image. It's much harder to have um, any of the other firmware emulations or any of the other bootloaders available. So this is something I'm going to be playing with shortly. OEL is our oldest existing port. Uh, first released with Lenny many, many years ago. So it's Softload ABI, used to be V4T. In the last year, um, the baseline has been moved forward to V5TE. That is still very well supported for most things. Um, we had been talking last year and the year before about maybe dropping it before Buster. Um, I have certainly lost interest in working on RBL, but other people have stepped up. Uh, that's great. So I know we have at least Adrian and Adrian and Roger. There are probably plenty of other people too. Apologies if I haven't mentioned your name. It's just I have a crap memory. I'm not trying to miss you out. Um, I have concerns occasionally that, I mean, we've seen in the past, and I'm sure we'll see again, that new people, new language runtimes or whatever, may not care about supporting anything older than V7. Um, this can be worked around, it can be fixed, but it can, it can also be quite a bit of work to do. Um, ongoing, uh, moving forwards, people are going to have to keep on working at this to keep it, to keep it running. It is well supported for things like the tool chain, no, sorry, for our core tool chain, C and C++, and for the kernel. Other stuff, we're going to have to manage expectations as to what goes in on the L, I think. So, the build these in hardware, we still have, and again, I'm, this slide is awesome, it's almost copied word for word from last year's. We still have those nice little orange boxes as our core set of build these for Army L and Army Jeff. Sponsored by Marvell, the Armada XP. They're lovely little machines, except they are still dev boards. So um, they don't power cycle without you pushing a button on it if you've, had, if you've removed power, which is a pain. They support, they, they're fast, they support 4 gigs of RAM, they could take more memory, but um, they only support a single disk. So we've had a spate of disk failures, as happens, of course, you know, disks are consumables, we know that. But when a disc or one of these things die, it is oh, it takes a day or so of messing around, swapping a disc, and then reinstalling. They also don't support Neon, and as that is something that people do need to care about in OMHF, we still have one of our older build Ds available, an IMX53. Um, that is now, I remember at the time when I installed a mini rack of those, Oh, it felt like the future. They were fast and awesome, and it had a whole gigabyte of memory. Now, they don't feel so fast. <laughs> so you can debug your problems, up, your problems on that machine. Please don't go building a whole tool chain or something on it. It will take a while. For ARM64, we have many wider options. Um, not all of these are yet in use, but I'm hoping to pick some up. We have the old AMD Seattle, so that was the Optron A1100 family. Um, Xgene was the Applied Micro um, CPU that's now been moved on, so um, Ampere have taken on what, was now, what is now Xgene 3. Cavium with their Thunder X, Thunder X2. Um, Marvell have another CPU that's 64 bit. Stay on. Um, which is going to be in their, you know, people are going to be using for next generation NAS devices and network, network things, which is, going, which is in the Macchiato bin. Um, Qualcomm are in this market trying to sell a really big, high-end, powerful server, the Centric, using their Fulcor CPU. Uh, there's the Synquasa, which is a 24-core Cortex-A53 machine from, or so it's at a CPU rather, from Socionext in Japan. Um, and I've got one of those at home I'm playing with. We have quite a wide range. Um, and fingers crossed, some of them will actually make it commercially and we'll be able to just buy them off the shelf. I keep on having my fingers crossed that that will happen soon. So, people, I'm assuming most of the people here will have seen the discussion triggered about really, um, architecture release qualification in particular to do with supporting the buildies. Um, 
DSA don't want to support dev boards anymore as buildies. Um, speaking as the person who ends up having to do a lot of the like trained monkey things of like popping discs and pushing buttons and whatever, because we host some of these in, in the data center at ARM, I 100% support these guys. It's getting really tedious. So we already have, as I mentioned, a range of 64-bit buildies. So in ARM64 machines that we're using as build these, and I don't see that being a problem anytime soon. We do, however, new, need new 32-bit, new so ARMEL, ARMHS build these. We've had a look for proper 32-bit server machines. I don't think there are any that are worth looking at. I know there's been suggestions of a few odds and sods, say like uh, NAS boxes and whatever, which are 32-bit, they're rack mount, but they come with one gig of RAM, maybe two gig of RAM. I don't think it's even worth looking at those machines as it stands. Um, we did have, can we have a mic down the front? We did have um, a company, Calzada, who were doing 32-bit ARM server machines, but unfortunately they've gone away. Uh, this might be a stupid question, but can't we use 64-bit machines in 32-bit mode for this, or no? Be patient for 10 more seconds. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> so, let's build A32, the 32-bit ARM instruction set, on ARM64. Yay! What could possibly go wrong? Now, well, actually there's a few things. Some ARM64 machines won't run A32 binaries natively. Um, this might come as a surprise to people who are used to the Intel world, but of course all the AMD 64 machines and the, and the Intel equivalents will of course sell on 32-bit software. Well, the reason for that is that in the Intel world, there was already this huge corpus of old 32-bit proprietary binaries that if your new 64-bit chip can't run, nobody will buy it. Nobody's interested. In the ARM world, it's slightly different. There's not that much 32-bit binary software out there that the server vendors actually care about in the slightest. So many of the server vendors have taken a look at the, the offerings from ARM, have decided, now I could have all of the silicon to do the 32-bit instruction decode and whatever, as well as all the 64-bit instructions onto the CPU, but that takes up more space. So rather than doing that, they say, let's just not bother. So it means maybe instead of fitting 20 cores of both into a single CPU, you might get 30 cores of 64-bit only, or 48 or something. If you're trying to sell a dedicated server box, the 32-bit story is actually not all that compelling. So hence, quite a number of those machines that I mentioned, um, the Centric and the Thunder X in particular, don't run 32-bit ARM binaries natively. They can in emulation, but why would you do that? You may as well do that on AMD64. So some of the machines we have will support it, um, and I'm, I'm already playing with those. So what I've already done is, and some people will have noticed, ARM ARM01, which is an ARM machine hosted by ARM in our data center, hence the naming, is actually now a 64-bit machine. It is a Seattle box, so eight cores of Cortex A57, 16 gigs of RAM. Lovely 2U rack mount box, will support multiple disks, it's got 10 gig Ethernet on board. It's a, it's a nice machine, and we've been, it's been building um, RMHN. Almost immediately, we, found, we did find the first problem here. Um, RMHF traditionally and um, has had alignment fix up enabled in the kernel for all of our buildies. This is how most people run things. Um, ARM CPUs actually do care about alignment, just like the older Spark CPUs, M68K, and a whole bu bunch of the bigger, older architectures. Um, so what does that mean? If you don't have alignment fix up turned on, and you have badly written code that assumes alignment doesn't matter, you will get a SIG bus, an alignment fault. The kernel on RMHF is configured to pick up and catch that exception, 
fix it all up in software, and then hand back to Userland. So Userland doesn't actually know it's happened, apart from one problem. Instead of it just being dealt with automatically on CPU because it didn't need to do anything extra, if the kernel gets involved, you can see this can take factors of hundreds or thousands of times longer. You know, there's huge delays going on while the kernel has to go on picking things in software to deal with, your, to deal with the bugs in the software you're running. This is not great. Um, if we actually have a look on the build Ds, and I saw this, uh, um, this is triggered all over the place by lots and lots of our code. Now, if we run this on an ARM64 machine, the ARM64 kernel does not include support for that alignment fix-up, and things fail. So we've had a few build failures already come out, uh, with, uh, and we've started reporting bugs. Um, what I've also seen is GLIPT in particular fails to build in OMHF running on ARM64 because of a mismatch with the SIG alt, the size of the SIG, the alternate signal stack. So SIG alt stack size does not match between OMHF and ARM64 and the kernel gets it wrong. This is a real kernel bug. Um, it's reported, I've reported to the ARM kernel guys, a fix is going upstream already and then we can backport it, but at the moment you can't build your libc in ARMHF on ARM64. I found as well that our Haskell builds for V7 are really badly mistargeted. Again, they're causing alignment faults of the wazoo. They're also um, trying to, actually, I believe they're targeting on V6, not on V7. So that means they're using the wrong um, CPU instructions for doing barriers. Now, barriers, in the ARM architecture have gone through quite a range of changes over the last few versions of the architecture. In V4, V4, V5, there was no support on CPU for doing this directly. If you want to get a barrier, you need kernel help. You can do it in V6. Sorry, Stephen. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you in the middle of the slide. but. Um, could we not take advantage of reproducible builds in this case? And um, in theory, a build on an ARM64 should produce the same result as the same build on a 32-bit native machine. Absolutely, it should do, and that's something I'd love to do. Yes. Um, at, at the moment, we're actually getting problems building in the first place, and, and this is one of the things I'm working out. Um, Haskell is mistargeted, as I said, it's using the wrong barriers. It will run OK on V7, it won't run on V8 it will actually, you end up with failures with illegal instruction exceptions. Um, so that needs a rebuild. Now, this is one of the few times when I actually w won't complain about Haskell needing to be rebuilt every, every other day because, of course, it means that when we do this fix-up, it would need to be rebuilt anyway. Fine. Um, I'm actually doing a complete build of the archive right now on three machines at home. So three of the machines I've already mentioned, the Macchiato, the Cinquesa, and the Seattle, I've, a, I've managed to get hold of one of each of those machines, and they're sat in my home office doing a rebuild at the moment. I can actually demonstrate. Um, just before I came up here, yes, we're up to, of the 28,000 odd packages, I don't know if you can see that at the back, of the 28,000 odd packages that are in the archive, I'm currently up to 21,800. That's taken about three weeks, so in about a week's time, I expect I will be able to give the full results. What I want to see is basically what other problems are there that might come out from building um, ARM HF on top of ARM64. I've already mentioned the first three I've found, um, what if, if we find that there's maybe a few hundred packages with alignment problems, I'm just going to start filing bugs and patches. If it's a few thousand, we're going to have to rethink this approach. Um, so at the moment, this is just building in an ARM HF Chirut. The other solution could be, and this links back to what I was saying earlier, we could run ARM HF um, virtual machines on top of ARM64, that does absolutely work, and at that point the guest kernel would do, for example, the alignment fix-ups. It would hide some of these problems. The only issue with doing that, of course, is at that point we then end up with binaries that we know will not run properly on ARM64. 
I think I would actually rather see the effort going in to fix these binaries properly and fix things up. Yeah. Uh, fixing alignment bugs, does that also help in 68K and Spark, for example? Yes, absolutely. You know, these are real bugs where people are, have just made invalid assumptions about uh, structural alignments. You know, we've all seen these before. Um, the, only way, the only reason that people get, get a free pass for this is because x86 doesn't care. Well, you might think so. x86 will run these binaries. If you have badly aligned code, it will run slower. You should always think about alignment of your structures when you're programming. But lots and lots, particularly, and I've, I've seen some frameworks, I think it was PyPy, um, just, just throw everything in. And of course, because the machines they're working on don't show any problems, oh, it must be your problem. No, it's not. So, discussion as well. God, I have monopolized more than I aim to. What else should we be talking about? What else should we be doing? Hi, uh, I'm from Ubuntu, and we are doing RMHF builds with uh, no fix up for yeah. a long time, and we experienced quite a lot of bugs, and yeah, yeah. many of those. And I would be happy to see, uh, we would be happy to see something uh, be done in Debian as well, because sure. that would uh, encourage Debian people to pick up our patches. Um, cool. So thank you for doing that. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if we could just disable fix ups on the BLDs is exactly the next thing I was about to mention. Yes, yes, so yes, thank you for bringing it up. Um, as has already been pointed out, Julian Christo, for example, said, we have at the moment a bad situation where you get inconsistent behavior depending on which machine you happen to be queued to build on. We should be disabling the alignment fix up on RHF as well. There is support in the kernel. You can actually tell it to fix things up, not fix things up or specifically report exactly where the problem came from. And that's a really nice thing. Um, I think that will be the right answer. So then we can explicitly start grepping through logs and filing bugs. It, again, it comes down to just how many packages are broken. Um, I would love to go through. We still have a few months before Buster freezes. If we have a few hundred packages that are broken, it's not too late to file bugs and get them fixed. I was wondering if you uh, plan creating auto package test for ARM64 because we are doing that too and some alignment issues are coming up uh, in uh, auto package test but not in the builds. Oh, awesome. Yes, um, that would be a lovely thing. Um, if you can share what you've got already, that would be good. Uh, we have auto package test running uh, in yeah. the Ubuntu infrastructure but it can't be copied directly to Debian so it would be sure. in need for a machine, I guess. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, one of the things, so I was talking about the build machines. Um, we will need, of course, to find a few more ARM64 machines to make this happen. Um, one of the machines I mentioned, where are we, this Inquasa, um, is something I do have a fair, a fair amount of experience with. It's, as I said, it's a Socionext um, um, system on chip design that is meant to be a server. So it will support up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. It's got multiple um, uh, disk interfaces on board, it's got gigabit Ethernet and stuff. And that all of that's boring. However, the useful thing is um, in Lenaro, which is where I do a lot of my work, um, the, we're actually working with Socio Next to get these boards out there on sale. Um, you can buy them right now. I'm hoping that they're going to be, we're going to start ramping up soon. I have an, an outstanding offer of a number of these machines as a donation to Debian. So what I'd like to do is get, say, four or five of these machines as build Ds. Cortex A53 is not very fast, but when you've got 24 of them in parallel, oh, they really, really win at building a kernel in parallel. They're a really nice machine. What I also want to do is get one or two of these to, to, do, to help us with auto package test, to help with um, Debian CI and whatever as well, so we can help improve our coverage across not just on x86. Um, I was just curious uh, if you think it would be feasible to get one of these boards for uh, for the reproducible builds project? Or, yes, or absolutely. two of these boards, actually, yeah, yeah. ideally? Uh, um, because right now we have mostly our ARM32 hardware, and then sure. if we had the ARM64 hardware we have is not enough to systematically build Fine. one way or the so, other. So I've asked for 10 of these. Um, okay. 
it, it's, it's wonderful. The guy in charge of Lenovo's enterprise group, sorry, I think it's just changed name, uh, Martin, is very much a fan of Debian. The Lenovo um, enterprise reference platform that they ship is basically Debian with a new kernel and a few updates. Um, he's a fan of Debian, he runs it at home, he really wants to help contribute back. So when I asked for a number of machines, um, he said, how many do you want? And I said, 10. <coughs> Assuming he would laugh at me and say, no, I've got two for you. And he said, mm, we can probably do that. I said, okay, no, we'll pay for them. And he said, to, no, 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 don't offend me. I want to give these to Debian. Um, I haven't got them in my hand yet. I said, I have one at home. I am hoping when I get back to get these organized and I want to get these spread out. So there'll be some going hopefully to Vancouver to go into UBC whacking where we have Debian machines. We'll get some of these maybe at Bytemark or somewhere in the UK and we will definitely have others that we can just send out. So wherever you need them for reproducible builds or for auto package tests or whatever, I want to get these all working and, and help improve. Of course, I've now gone on camera talking about Martin. He's probably embarrassed and I'm going to get, sh going to get shouted at Tuesday when I'm back in the office. Oh, well. Yes? Um, we, we've been teased with rumors of these fast, powerful 24-core ARM servers for several years now, but I, I still never actually got my hands on one. Why, yes. why have they never made it mainstream and then become cheaper or widely used by hosting companies and so on? It's depressing. Um, there's lots and lots of companies are trying to make it in the ARM64 server world. Um, my take on it, and other people would disagree, I know, is that lots of these companies, each of them are trying to do the next big deal that would get them selling 100,000 of these systems. Um, the first thing that each of them needs to do, possibly, at least a couple of them, is to help prove the market, is go and sell the first 1,000 of them. Or even better, maybe give away the first 1,000 to people like us, because obviously that would be good. Um, and then actually seed the market and demonstrate that they're good and useful and make things work. Instead, what people have been focusing on, and I understand it might look more attractive commercially, each of them has been talking to the big cloud vendors, for example, where they know that they can, if they can convince them, they will be able to say, here are 50,000 machines delivered on a single, you know, you know, on the back of a few trucks to the same data center. <coughs> That's wonderful for your bottom line, but unfortunately, it does nothing to advance the architecture. It does nothing to advance, to be honest, your own sales. You know, um, it's the ARM ecosystem is special in many ways. We've had a habit over the years of, um, of most of the SOCs, of course, have been in mobile phones recently, where people do expect to sell half a million of the same thing, and then next year, that will be thrown away and you do half a million of the next thing, which is slightly more features, slightly more powerful. Servers are different. What we actually need is someone who's got the staying power, someone who's got the consistency, A, to stay in the market. A number of people have tried and have, have abandoned or have even failed and gone bust. So we want people to stay in the market. We want people to give us things where we can continue to buy essentially the same machine three years from now. And I know that's not just us, lots and lots of enterprise customers, of course, will want exactly the same thing. It's a difficult sell at the moment, it's a difficult conversation to have, and I've had it with a number of execs from various of, the, of these vendors. I hope one of them understands and actually makes it work. Um, we'll see. So, what else should we be doing? What else can we be doing? Um, is everybody happy with where we are? Is anybody awake? <laughs> so, okay, I'll carry on wibbling as nobody else is. We do have, um, to go with ARM64, we now have OpenStack images. Well, in fact, we've, we've, had them ever, we've had them for a while, ever since we did the first stretch release. Um, there are more server-based things that can be supported on ARM, and they are being supported. Um, there's been um, recent announcements by various of the big, um, for example, CI, CD people, like Travis, and, oh, my 
current memory is failing. There was another one announcement earlier this week where people are now starting to, to support their central cloud-based services on ARM64, just the same as on, as on AMD64. Those are really great things that hopefully will help people to find some of their bugs, like alignment problems and you know all of the other things that we're trying to track down. It will be nice if we're not the only ones. Um, I can only hope it continues. So of course, there's lots of efforts going on to convince more people to make their services portable to more architectures. You know, we seem to have a habit in the computer industry of um, every five to ten years, there's always the phrase of like all the world's a fax, all the world is a sun, all the world's a 68k. Now it's all the world's Intel. Um, it would be nice if we could learn from more mistakes in the past and actually keep portable and keep spreading, you know, not putting all our eggs in one basket every time. But that's, it works out to be cheaper, and cheap always wins. Um. Um, uh, as the Yubu maintainer, I've uh, been experimenting a lot with the EFI implementation in Yubu, which awesome. will open a lot of opportunities for mostly ARM64, although I've seen some recent commits where maybe even in general ARM32 <coughs> might start working. Um, Yay. The thing I have been noticing, however, is depending on how the, the device trees in U-Boot then get passed on to the through EFI, and you don't use you don't end up using the device tree from the kernel, and if they're sufficiently out of sync, you tend to get some weird behaviors. Sometimes there are good behaviors, like devices sure. just work that yeah. weren't working. Uh, so, so that and and. It, and then U-Boot just pulls in the device tree from the kernel, so you get these weird issues where the device tree is out of sync with the kernel, and I know you probably have a few rants about this. <laughs> I was about to say, can I interrupt you and rant about device tree? So, device tree is an awesome idea. Do, hands up anyone who doesn't know what device tree is. Okay, I'll explain. So, back in the the awful, the dark ages, it used to be that you would need to build your kernel for each, almost for each different ARM device individually. You couldn't have a common kernel because you had to configure things specifically with a kernel config. Um, device tree was, um, it's <coughs> very sim similar to um, open firmware and whatever from the PowerPC world. It's a way of describing your hardware in a reasonably portable way so that you can have the firmware pass on information about the hardware that's connected. You know. So it's where your memory's connected, it's where your serial port is, it's, it's how to talk to your network devices, it's where PCI is, it can be a whole range of things. But well, basically it's how to describe your machine such that a generic kernel can then work out work, you know, how to talk to things. It's lovely as a concept. Unfortunately, we've ended up with a chicken and egg situation, and we've never really gone beyond it. The whole point of Device Tree was meant to be that your firmware would know how to describe things, and it would then pass this information on in a fixed, clean, portable way. Unfortunately, the way Device Tree has been interpreted by the kernel over the years has been a moving target. So, because none of the devices we started with had working device tree built in, we had to, su to supply a device tree blob with the kernel. So that then means that the kernel will have to actually know what your device is, even though the whole point is it's not meant to. So you then had to, I say at installation time, hopefully the kernel could work it out, or in some cases you would have to tell it which device you're running on and then install that device tree. That's okay. The plan was always we, that wouldn't be a permanent thing. But we're now multiple years on, and guess what? No one trusts the device tree that ships with the firmware to be up to date, because it might not be, as Vagrant says. The kernel might have differing ideas about how to drive things. So you then end up forever having to keep chasing against the current kernel. There might be a difference from, say, 4.16 to 4.17 that means you have to use a different device tree specific to that kernel version. This is broken. Um, unfortunately, 
because of the vagaries of the market and the time taken to get things fixed, it may never get fixed, and that's a problem. The move to go to ACPI, ACPI, did I mention, yes, for OM64 is indirectly as a consequence of this. ACPI and Device Tree are actually equivalent, mostly. They both do the same job. They both describe the hardware. Well, at least part of ACPI does. There's more to it, but that's this, for, the, for this discussion, those are irrelevant. The point of ACPI is you can't supply it later. So you have to trust what comes in firmware. Um, because of that, the, the, the vendors have to supply a working ACPI tree or the device just won't work. That, unfortunately, is possibly where we should have started with device tree all those years ago to say, we will not support your devices until you give us firmware that works. Unfortunately, so once we have critical mass, the next vendor coming in knows what they have to do and will probably do it right. They might need beating up and, you know, they will need help and encouragement to do it right, sorry, not beating up. Um, but they will do it right because they know if they don't, for example, the Red Hat kernel, the Debian kernel, will boot on their hardware and say, I can't drive anything. You have, the customers will go away. The mobile targeted CP SOCs, unfortunately, are all the other way around. They're quite happy to continue doing whatever broken things they've been doing for many years, and it's our problem to chase them. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's the other way around. So this is why many people are pushing for a CPI. There are a bunch of documents from, from ARM which are being used to try and convince vendors to do the right thing with their firmware and with their SOCs. So there's the EBBR, which is the enterprise-based boot requirements, if I remember correctly. And there's a whole bunch of um, standard-ish documents that are coming out to describe how things should work. But we're still chasing after a bunch of uh, um, SOCs that are already out there and nobody's interested in reverse engineering things. Nobody's interested in going back rather and redoing how they work. So, yeah, that's where we are. Um, the right answer would be, should be that the kernel stops changing the device trees and we should just be using what's available. Um, so my friend Leif, who's back in the UK, could rant even more about this and get really, really frustrated. Um, he's a UEFI maintainer, um, and his job has been made so much harder by people not doing it right. So we are down to about two minutes left. Sorry, I spoke far too much. Last. Um, it seems uh, I'm the only one that care about RVL in this room. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, um, so the, uh, the most concern uh, to let e, uh, ARMEL to uh, go to Buster is the uh, uh, DSA concern, right? Yeah. yeah. So if we can find uh, uh, some device to, uh, for, to qualify the build, build D, uh, then ARMEL is okay for the Buster, right? I think so. So, in fact, so going back to where I was, the thing I wasn't clear about is I'm currently doing a rebuild with RMHF. The moment I've finished analysing those results, I'm going to reuse the same machines and do a rebuild with RMEL. Um, we don't want to just switch over to new RMEL or RMHF devices to, as build Ds, um, if we, uh, we, unless they are proper server machines with sufficient memory, storage and <laughs> CPU. What is much more likely to convince DSA would be to have essentially more of the ARM64 server machines also building on ARMEL. That's where I would like, uh, that's where I want to get to. So while I'm not spending much of my effort on, on ARMEL, I'm more than happy to do another rebuild and provide all the logs. Okay, so, so if I uh, understand correctly, so ARMEL shares the same status with ARM HF, right? Um, Almost. Very close, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. So, the orange Marvell boxes that we're using for both architectures at the moment are not considered acceptable for much longer. 
and again, I understand DSA, I agree with them totally on that. It, we, we do want to move on to better supportable uh, machines for building. Yeah, I yeah. agree with the DSA too. And I uh, got a few e emails from uh, building minister um, privately that they want to donate the hardware or donate some money to support uh, AMEL and uh, AMEL. Sure. But, but they, they want to know the, uh, the, like the hard, hardware, what kind of hardware to, uh, is more qualified for the building. Yeah. Sure, so exactly, so that's why I'm doing this rebuild. So the machines I mentioned at the bottom of this slide, the Seattle, the X-Gene, the Macchiato, the Sinquasa, will all build 32-bit and 64-bit software. Um, the Thunder X, the Centric, and some of the other machines coming will only do 64. So we're looking at having a quite a large set of ARM64 machines to cover both needs. And I think we're probably just about out of time. We are, la very last thing I'm going to say is obviously you know where to find us. If you do have more questions or comments or you want to join in, hash Debian ARM, the Debian ARM list, and thanks to everyone. We're out of time, obviously. I'm still going to be around the rest of the day. Please accost me if you want to talk about this, and we'll discuss on the list as well. Thanks very much, folks.